In 2013, Adidas released Boost Foam. Now, I think in hindsight, we can look at Boost Foam as the first real super foam. It's the first time that midsole technology became the emphasis of racing shoes or what evolved into super shoes. Over the next few years, Adidas released various racing flats, but they got complacent. And by 2017, Nike released this, the Vaporfly 4%, which changed everything literally overnight. And for the next you know, handful of years, Nike released iterations of the Vaporfly, the one, the two, the three. Additionally, they did a completely separate line in the Alpha Fly, Alpha Fly 1, 2, and 3. But like Adidas did before, Nike got complacent. And by 2023, Adidas released this shoe, the Evo 1. Now this shoe, I think, has really changed the super shoe conversation because this shoe is really setting up what's next in super shoes, what we're going to be talking about over the next three to five years. There's an interesting story of innovation here, and that's what I'm going to get into in this video. In product development, there's a concept known as the iron triangle, though as product designers, we often just think about it as the good, fast, and cheap rule. And what this rule states is that you can pick two of these, you can't have all three. Though my experience is that you need to prioritize one of these, by doing that, you're going to get the relationship to another one, and then you need to either disregard or mitigate the third one to get the best result for the product. Now, if we take these ideas and we map them out to what product designers in shoe brands are thinking about, they're really looking at these variables, performance, durability, and cost. And for performance, I'm combining weight and fit and geometry and how the shoe runs. All of that's in that bucket. Durability is obviously, you know, how long is this shoe going to last or how long is the optimal state of the shoe going to last and cost is pretty obvious. How much is this thing going to cost? Now, for something basic like a daily trainer, like a Nike Pegasus, the team is starting with these variables, all sort of equally weighted, but because of the category of this shoe, they're weighting this for what the category really needs. In a daily trainer, you need to prioritize durability over that. You can put a little into the performance category, and then you want to keep costs down. Now, if we look at a standard super shoe, and this is the Metaspeed Edge Paris from ASICS, Again, the designers have the same three variables, but they're going to balance them in a different way. A super shoe needs to be performance first. They need to keep cost in check, and durability honestly isn't a huge concern. It's not something that they completely disregard, but for a standard super shoe, it's the least of the three of these. Now, if we take the Adidas Evo 1, which is a super shoe, but I would also argue that this is a hyper shoe. This is a tech prototype. This shoe is the bleeding edge pushing the innovation in a completely new direction. What the team balanced here was performance above all. And with that, cost goes up almost exponentially. Once you get performance over a certain level and you're really pushing it, and in this case, beyond just a standard super shoe, cost is going through the roof. And as I said in the intro, I think the Evil One is a very important shoe because it is changing the conversation. This is setting what is next for super shoes this is creating a new era that we're entering in in 2024. now this shoe is bleeding edge pushing the boundaries in every possible way including price we've talked a lot about the price on this channel everyone else has talked about the price of the shoe and again this is a shoe that is bleeding edge tech prototype it's not meant for every runner adidas is really really trying to hone in on what's next. And I think this shoe really encapsulates three things that we're going to be talking about over the next three to five years. The weight of this shoe. Adidas went across the board reducing weight everywhere they can in this shoe in the most extreme ways, in the sense of lightest weight upper, lightest weight and most optimized midsole foam, a new type and a new approach to an outsole, as well as the minimal of other components, as in the plates or the rods, since it's an Adidas shoe and a lot of the other components of this shoe. This shoe has been stripped down to really maximize weight. And weight, I think, is the first real big thing that we're going to be talking about over the next three to five years. This has been validated by ASICs, ASICs of all companies. ASICs is a very innovative company, but they're not known for jumping on trends and they're not known for... Uh, jumping on something that isn't really valuable. 
And with the new Metaspeed Paris series, ASICS really has focused in on the weight of these shoes. It was one of the key things in the marketing of these shoes. And they've gotten these shoes without extreme um, design choices to about 6.4, 6.5 ounces, the sky is the lighter of the two, 182, 184 grams. Puts it on par with the Vaporfly 3. If we compare the Evo 1 with a few other of the current super shoes against some of the racing flats and lightweight, I would say racing prototypes that have come out in the past, I think you can see that as light as the Evo 1 is at 138 grams or 4.86 ounces, there's still a lot of room to go. The Saucony Endorphin Racer was one of the most extreme road racing flats. Really, it was a track flat for uh, road racing at 88 grams or 3.1 ounces. But I think that possibly is the direction that we're headed. If you look at the Adidas Adios Pro 3, a shoe that's just coming up on two years old now at 215 grams or 7.58 ounces, you can see a lot of the optimizations that brands have made in super shoes over the past two years to lighten them. But there's still a long way to go. I'm going to make the argument that we're headed for a sub four ounce or 113 grams, even probably closer to 3.5 ounce or 100 gram super shoes in the next three to five years. Now, if you look at the Chinese brands, Anata, Li Ning, 361, they all have sub 100 gram or 3.5 ounce super shoes. Now with the Chinese brands, you never really know what's real. You never actually know how it feels on foot or actually runs and that matters. But the Chinese brands are really pushing the boundaries as far as weight. And I think we're going to see the mainstream Western brands do the exact same thing. The next area that I think we're going to see a lot of exploration in is the geometry of the midsoles. Now, if you look at some of the current 2024 models that are coming out that are really pushing the boundaries here, like the Mizuno Rig Rebellion Pro 2 or the Puma Fast RB or the Hoka Cielo X1, these shoes are really exploring how geometry aided by super foams with carbon plates or some sort of plate are really benefiting how these shoes actually run. Now, these shoes are not concerned with being legal for racing. They're not concerned with weight. They're just exploring these boundaries. And I think this is going to be very important uh, for what comes next. What's going to be the next generation of shoes? Because I think they're going to have some new approaches to geometries as things mature, as new materials come into the conversation. So you can look at each one of these three shoes as really the development testbed for these brands to really push that forward. And lastly, the other place we're going to see a lot of development is in what I'm calling plate dynamics. And I think the best example of this right now in 2024 is this shoe, the Hoka Cielo X1. Really a lot of what Hoka is doing with their carbon fiber plates. Now in this exploded view, you can see the plate and there's a lot going on with that plate. There's a lot going on with this shoe, but especially that plate. Hoka is really exploring how carbon fiber plates should work and interface with the super foam in the shoe and how they should run and influence the run dynamics of the shoe. If you combine all three of those things, weight, geometry, and plate dynamics, you get this shoe. And that's why I think the Adidas Evo 1 is such a big deal. Now, obviously they've emphasized weight above everything else, but there is a new geometry in the shoe, at least for the Audi Zero line, and I would say Adidas has been a little bit of ahead of the game as far as plate dynamics, given that they moved to rods early on and they're not using just a carbon fiber plate. Those rods allow for a lot more tuning, which no doubt they factored into the foam that they put in the shoe, the Light Strike Pro Evo foam, the Piba foam that they put in this shoe. Now, I've made a lot of content talking about this shoe, what it is and what it isn't. I'll link all that in the description. But at $500 USD, this is not a shoe meant for every runner. And again, at $500 USD, Adidas is selling this shoe at a huge loss. But by putting this out there in the market, they're getting a lot of feedback on it. And that feedback is going to be really valuable for them to perfect the shoe and turn it into a true consumer model. But I'm going to say that we're going to see a lot more shoes in the next two to three years that look a lot more like this shoe, the Adidas Takumi Sen 10, as far as a geometry and stack height. Now, think about it this way. If manufacturers strip down the uppers to the most lightweight materials, they also put 
the new approach to outsole rubber on there. And the rubber is usually one of the heaviest parts of a running shoe, especially a super shoe. And they maximize and they reduce the weight as much as they can. And they get these shoes to on par with where the evil one is right now. The next thing that they're going to be able to do, or they're going to have to do in many cases, is look at stack heights. Because if they can reduce the stack height of the midsole, they can save some weight. They can save considerable weight in some instances. So I don't think we're going back to, you know, 13 mil in the forefoot, 20 mil in the heel racing flats. But the Takumi Sen is a 34, 26, 7 mil drop shoe. So it's still in the 30s in the heel, but it's not butting right up against that 40 mil stack height limit. And when we get next gen foams, and they will be coming in the next two to three years because Piba is not the end of the foam story, there will be something next. That's how these things work. I think if you take the lower stack height, you get the same energy return, you get the same roll, you get the same performance of a high stack super shoe, but now you're in a much thinner midsole that's much lighter weight and much more stable, that's a win-win for everybody. Another shoe and brand that we need to discuss is the Alpha Fly 3 from Nike because the Alpha Fly has been going its own direction and I would say that it is probably the second most successful super shoe of the current moment. But Nike had a big event last month where they talked a lot about innovation super cycles and that they're just at the very beginning of one of these innovation super cycles. Now, they've done remarkable things with the Alpha Fly 3, getting that shoe to under 7 ounces or 198 grams. There's a lot of foam, a lot of tech. There's a lot of shoe there, and they made a real point to emphasize the weight savings of this shoe. There's also geometry, and there's some interesting plate dynamics there too. But I'm going to say that we should also be looking at the Air Zoom Victory 2 track spike that just came out as a possible future of where the Alpha Fly platform is maybe headed. Now, the Victory 2 is a track spike that's not meant for road racing, but it has all of the same technologies that the Alpha Fly 3 has, and it's about three and a half ounces or 100 grams, though Nike hasn't put out the official specs for this shoe yet. Everyone that's reporting on it is saying it's around three and a half ounces. That, I think, is the sweet spot and the target that a lot of brands are heading for with uh, road super shoes. The weight savings is massive for a long distance, like a half or a full marathon. If we're talking about Nike's innovation super cycle, we have to talk about this shoe, the Nike Street Fly 2. Now, I normally don't show or talk about unreleased prototypes on this channel, so Nike, please bear with me. But I think this shoe is too important not to talk about right now because it encapsulates everything I've been talking about this video. Weight savings, geometry, and plate dynamics. So if you look at the stack height of this shoe, you see that there's much more foam in the shoe than there was in the original Street Fly. In fact, this shoe looks very similar in stack height to the Takumi Sen 10 that I just talked about. It looks like it's about 34 mil in the heel. However, it looks like there's a much lower drop in the shoe. I would say about a four mil drop. So the forefoot of the shoe is probably 28, 30 mil somewhere around that, which is a new take on geometry. But I think what's even more important about this is the plate position. Now you can see the seam in the midsole. If I draw where I think the plate is in this shoe, it's this red line. That is essentially the spoon plate from the Vaporfly, but now positioned in the shoe in a much different way, a much different geometry. This shoe is going to run much more aggressive. Additionally, Nike has added a huge toe spring to this shoe. And they've upped the aggression of the forefoot of the shoe by a considerable amount. Now, this is not meant to be a marathon racer. This is going to be Nike's 5 to 10K racer. But this is showing that Nike is really, really looking at all of these things. Stripping down the upper, looking at geometry, how they can make this shoe run more aggressive. I think they learned a lot from probably the feedback from elites and pros on the Vaporfly 3 that it wasn't aggressive enough. So they're really ramping it up here. And you can see that they're playing with plate dynamics with the position of the classic Vaporfly plate in this shoe. I think this is going to be one of the most interesting shoes Nike will release in 2024 or 2025. In the first half of 2024, I think this is where we currently are. We have these three categories of super shoes. 
we have the Everybody Racers, the Saucony Endorphin Pro 4, the Asics Super Blast, and the New Balance SC Elite V4. I think these are Everybody Racers. These are super shoes that everyone can run in. Everyone's going to do well in them. They're not the fastest. They're not the most bleeding, cutting edge shoe, but they're going to work for the most amount of runners. And I think there's a lot of great selection. There's more than just these three. In the super shoe category, which is the sort of top tier, what we're seeing on podiums at world major marathons, I think, again, we have these shoes, the Adidas Adios Pro 3, a shoe that's been around for almost two years now. The Nike Alpha Fly 3 and the recent Asics Metaspeed Paris series are all doing exceptionally well. And I think we have this category of hyper shoes. I've been talking about this category, you know, since the beginning of this channel, but things like the Adidas Prime X2 Strung, the Puma Fast RB, and yes, I would put the Adidas Evil One in this hyper shoe category. These are shoes that are intentionally pushing the boundaries of tech. The Prime X is really looking at cushioning technologies and upper technologies. The Fast RB from Puma is really pushing kind of everything, geometry, foam, plates, uppers, everything about that shoe. And as I've talked about, the Evil One is really pushing the boundaries of what a super shoe is. So while I think a lot of people are looking at the Evo 1 as sort of the best super shoe of the moment, and it really is, it really is in this hyper shoe category. The Evo 1 is not the destination. It's only the start. We're going to evolve considerably past where the Evo 1 is right now. How do we get from here, where we are today, to what's next? Well, I'm going to say by 2026, definitely by 2027, we're going to see a lot of these shoes begin to evolve into that next generation, the true next gen shoe. And I think that's going to be a combination of the hyper shoes, all of that tech and all that experimentation that's going on in that category, merging with the refined super shoes. Again, I think super shoes are going to get lighter with the current technologies, but they're going to come together and sometime in 2026, definitely by 2027, we're going to see really what's next. New foams, new approaches, new dynamics and how the shoe actually runs. It's coming and it's going to be very exciting. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you find this content useful, consider subscribing. You'll see more content from me pop up in your feed. If not, drop a like on this video because it helps this channel continue to grow, which I always appreciate. And with that, I'll catch you in the next one.